Hi everyone, it's Carrie Brummer here and I welcome you to another episode of How to Be an Artist Creator Profile. And I'm really excited today because I have a guest that I think is going to bring so much value to this community. We're welcoming today Patricia Young. She's a licensed clinical social worker and she specializes in working with HSPs or highly sensitive persons. And we're going to talk about what that means. I think many of you in this community are HSP and may not even know it. And it's actually this superpower if we better understand it and kind of learn more about what it means to be HSP. And I want you guys to feel empowered by some of the qualities that that make up HSP. So thank you so much, Patricia, for being here. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited. I am too. So I know that some people in this community may have read the book by Elaine Aaron called The Highly Sensitive Person. I don't know that everyone has. So can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be HSP? You bet. So there's a formal definition and an informal definition. And I love to start with the informal, which is if you've ever been told that you're too sensitive, you're too dramatic, you're too intense, you think too much, you worry too much, you need to get thicker skin, you might be a highly sensitive person. And it it's something that we're born with, so it's not due to trauma, it's not due to wounding or injury. It occurs in about 30% of the population, 20% of the population. <laughs> my brain and my mouth don't always work well together. <laughs> Dr. Aaron uh, estimates 15 to 20% of the population. So 80% of the world are not highly sensitive. So we often feel like misfits, the black sheep, the truth tellers, because we, the way that we come wired is we notice so many more details than non HSPs. So often our sense of reality is very different than the non highly sensitive person. And go ahead. I was just going to reinforce that that's one reason I think so many creatives are HSP and don't necessarily realize it. We're very attuned to detail and observation. And I think sometimes that can be really overwhelming. And then we can also feel very vulnerable around this and then put ourselves down or even shut down our creative practice because we're so overwhelmed by these feelings. Right. There are four core characteristics. I'll try and make this brief. I, before we started recording, I said, like, once I get going, I'm kind of like a little steamroller because I get so excited. So I'm going to try and keep the reins in. But Dr. Aaron defines four core characteristics that really make up the trait of being highly sensitive. And it spells out the acronym DOES or DOES. So D is for depth of processing. We're deep thinkers. And so on the negative side, you might have been told you can't let things go. You can't shrug things off. You ruminate. It's just because we process things very deeply and we have a more active insula. Like this is how we're wired. It's not that we're just being picky or something. This is literally how we're wired. So oftentimes we take more time to pause and reflect before we make decisions. Sometimes we just want to take in a lot of information before we respond because we really want to get all the aspects of something before we jump in. The O is for overstimulation or overarousal, which is exactly what you're talking about because we're, we take in so much more information. And I had somebody on my podcast and she talked about, these aren't exact numbers, but I just like to use them. So in the brain of a highly sensitive person, we may be taking in 20 pieces of information in a situation because our brain is lit up in all these areas where a non-HSP is maybe taking in five pieces of information. And I had an experience with my husband who's not an HSP. We did this thing and it was really uncomfortable and he kind of couldn't understand why I was so upset about it. And I really had to think like, well, I've got 20 pieces of data and you have five. Mm -hmm. So often our sense of reality is challenged. You know, had I, if I were not an informed and educated HSP, I would have thought like, maybe I'm making a big deal out of this stuff. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm being too sensitive, man. Maybe I'm being too emotional. And I'm clear, like those 20 pieces of data that I have, it was a really weird situation. So being an informed and educated is really important, but because we take in so much information, I can see I'm already on my little steam train. <laughs> it's great. Keep going. <laughs> I'm just so excited. Um, we do get overstimulated and over aroused. So our ability to be out in the world, oftentimes we need to have time to come home and retreat, to mm -hmm. replenish because we're just, you know, it's like, we're just kind of taking in stuff all the time. Yeah. The E is for emotional responsiveness or empathy. So we have more mirror neurons. 
We feel things more deeply. We don't like watching animals get hurt or children get hurt. We often don't like scary movies. If we hear sirens, it can be upsetting because we associate that with somebody getting hurt. We tend to not like to get startled. Like that's not really a fun thing for us. I can't watch the news because we're deeply feeling. We just have more empathy and it can make it hard too to set limits with people and set boundaries because we imagine in their favor how they're going to feel hurt as opposed to tuning in with how it's going to help us. And we often have a challenge with conflict. We're really good at knowing what other people need because we are so perceptive and tuned in. And often the way that we survived was to figure out what other people needed. So we're really good at it. But being able to know what we need and to take care of ourselves can be challenging if you haven't done your work. And then the last one is awareness of subtle stimuli. So we're going to notice things in the environment more than non-HSPs. And brain scans have shown that um, that's that's emotional responsiveness. I have a little cheat sheet because I get so excited that I, I kind of screw up. So that was, that was a little mistake. Oh. I'm perfect. So we notice subtle details that other people miss. So nonverbal okay. cues, small changes in the environment. Mm-hmm. This is kind of a double-edged sword that oftentimes we will pick up on something, but the story that we make up in our heads may not be accurate. So if you and I are having an interview and maybe you had something uncomfortable happen this morning, your panties are too tight, you had an argument, your stomach is upset, I may pick up on something. But if I don't say like, hey, Carrie, is something going on? Then if I'm talking about something that's personal, what I may do is go like, oh, when I talk about personal stuff, it makes Carrie uncomfortable. I better not do that. So so this is one of those things that can work either for us or against us because we do notice things, but the reality around what it is may not be what the meaning that we're attaching to it. I already felt like I should have a notebook out and be furiously (laughs) writing everything down or just have a tick box to be like, yep, yep, that's me. Like so many of those things I connect with. And I'm sure many people watching this too are like, oh my goodness, it's okay to be sensitive. It's, It's not weird that I hate loud noises or I don't like violent movies. You know, there are so many of these things where I feel like you know, uh, our family, well-meaning or not, sometimes dismiss how we feel or the way we perceive the world. And then that also impacts our desire to take risks in our lives, even with things like being creative. Yep. Well, and what the research shows is if we have difficult childhoods, we have a higher rate of anxiety and depression Mm. than non-HSPs. This is anecdotal on my part. I believe it, but I, I can't back it up. Mm -hmm. But I think all it takes is having a parent, like for us to be feeling something and a parent to go like, stop worrying about it. Or, you know, don't be so sensitive, shrug it off. Mm -hmm. This is how we're wired. And our parents are supposed to teach us how to be in touch with our feelings, how to regulate, how to manage our feelings. And if they're not tuned in, or they don't have that skill, just those very, I mean, our parents can be very well-meaning, very well-intentioned. We could have wonderful childhoods. And for the people that tend to not like their sensitivity, there's usually what I call wounding, which is kind of where this happens. So if you hate your sensitivity, you hate your responsiveness, it's probably because there was wounding and and you're more identified with the wounding than the amazing strengths that we have being highly sensitive. Mm-hmm. Yes. Amen. <laughs> I already am so excited about this. Yeah. So, so Patricia, tell us, where does all this passion come from? What inspired you to go down this path of studying and supporting HSPs? Well, you know, 50% of people in therapy are highly sensitive. What that says to me is we want to know about ourselves. We want to figure things out. I'm a therapist by trade. I do coaching now so I can reach more people. And I found a method that's really effective in working with highly sensitive people. But when we don't know, we also have a, a really strong inner voice, like that little inner narrator that's always, you know, commenting on what's going on. Like most people don't have that. But, but we don't know because we've got, you know, this constant internal dialogue, like we have really rich internal lives. And I, I always knew there was something different about me and I felt like something was wrong with me. And when I learned about it, it was just like, oh. I, I literally went back and rewrote the narrative of my life with mm-hmm. the lens of being highly sensitive. And I was with a group of other highly sensitive therapists and realized like, I really have a, a very deep understanding of what this is and feel like this is where I want to make my mission. And I really, my, my passion is I want everybody to know about the trait of sensitivity. I want people to know that it's an amazing strength. We're loyal, we're conscientious, we're creative, we're the healers. We are great listeners. We like the world needs highly sensitive people, but 
the story around sensitivity and even the name highly sensitive, people think of emotional and dramatic and you can't control yourself. That is so not what it means to be highly sensitive. And so like, I just want to change what the narrative is around it and provide education so that if you have these traits and you hate some of the things about it, you do the healing work that you need to do so you really can thrive as a highly sensitive person. Mm -hmm. And when we do our work, our capacity to deal with things that, that we're not initially able to do really can increase. And so, you know, I used to not want to go out and do stuff. I, I've gone to a couple conferences this year. I went to a brunch with people that I didn't know. There were 50 women there. Like if you had said a year or two ago, do you want to do this? Like, oh, heck no, I don't think so. So as we work with our traits, we really can expand our capacity so that we can experience more of life as opposed mm -hmm. to it's too much, it's too people-y, no thank you. Mm -hmm. So tying to this, you know, you've you've created a podcast all about being highly sensitive. Will you will you tell us about it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll well, sing it from the rooftops. Um, yes. It's called unapologetically sensitive because I really want us to be okay about how we are. And um, I do a combination. Really, I started out doing interviews because I felt like I don't have anything to say and I, I can't carry a podcast on my own. I'm about 10 months in now. And now I do a ton of bonus solo episodes because I do have a lot to say and I'm incredibly passionate. And the bonus episodes tend to be really vulnerable posts like I had something happen with a long-term friend. And what I know how to do is to sit down and record when something happens. I, I do sit on it before I release it. I, I do have yeah. that amount of self-control. But, and the ones that, the episodes that I'm like, uh, I don't know if I really want to release this are the ones that resonate the most with people. I think people are wanting honesty and vulnerability. I really believe on about breaking the shame and, you know, talking about our gremlins and that's how we create freedom. And because we have so much that goes on with us internally, it gets really noisy and being able to talk about what's going on helps to take the noise out of here. And it just becomes so much simpler when we can talk about what's going on. Yeah. I really like your combination of interview and your own kind of self-reflection or just storytelling that, and, and um, kind of, I don't know, getting us to think about our own uh, choices and, and behavior and how it all connects because it's, it really offers people not only just kind of external insight from other people, but also a window into how you're processing. And I do think that really helps people connect. I, um, I'll make sure guys that you have a link when this video is done um, below the video so that you can take a listen. I, I do recommend Patricia's podcast. I found it very helpful and very insightful. Thanks. Thanks. I really am transparent about what I struggle with and how I navigate through things because I just don't feel like we have enough of that. You mm -hmm. go to social media and everybody's at, it appears that everybody's having these amazing lives where they're connected and all this stuff. And nobody talks about, you know, being at home eating ice cream all weekend because it feels <laughs> like it's just too much out there. And so I really am passionate about using what I struggle with to help people see like, this is how I go through it. And it's not that we don't struggle, but it gets to the point where we're like, yeah, had a hard time yesterday. Yeah, I had a big reaction today as opposed to like, oh my gosh, you know, that's about breaking the shame. Right. Yeah. And I think too, it's such a, it's a, such a good way to kind of separate ourselves from our emotional experience. Cause we are not, we don't have to be our emotions. We can mm -hmm. experience them and honor them and move through them. But sometimes I know myself, I can have a really hard time when I'm really triggered by an email someone sends me or a post on social media, someone comments on something. Sometimes it can be really hard to not ruminate and let oh, go. Oh, right. Well, and I think it's really all about self-compassion mm -hmm. that, you know, what happens is I'll have a re I, I did an episode about like, if this happens, this is how you lean into it. And then within two days, something else happened. And like, I reacted and I reacted that I reacted. And then I judged and felt like an imposter because like, here, I've got this podcast. I just told you like, if this happens, this is what you do. Right. And like, I'm stuck in my own stuff. Right. So I did an episode about it because we judge it and we feel like we shouldn't be. And that just, it, the feelings get really stuck as opposed to like, yeah, having a hard time today kind of sucks. Oh, yeah, well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, I feel like I had my next question was, do you find creatives that tend to be highly sensitive? But I feel like we've already answered that question. So what what are strategies you feel highly sensitive creatives could use to harness this as a strength rather than seeing it as a weakness? 
I think the most important thing is to become an informed and educated HSP. If people are curious, you can go to hsperson.com. There's a self-test there. If you think you're highly sensitive and you don't hit the cutoff, Dr. Aaron suggests to take the child version of the test and think back to when you were a child. I think when we know that this is how we're wired and if we've got wounding, we do the work around it, then it's not a problem. Like I had a situation with my husband where I wanted a room painted in the house and he'd painted one room and like I could see the old color sticking through and a little bit of stuff on the ceiling. And I, I didn't want that in the new room. And he's like, you're really picky. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> 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 I'm really detail oriented and those things I'm going to notice. And right. I don't want to be thinking about the yellow paint and the stuff on the ceiling when I'm in this room, I want to experience joy. Could I live with it? Yeah. Do I have to? No, no. Had I not done my work, I'm sure that every time something would come up, it's like, yeah, that's because I'm so picky. You know, you got to do your own work so that like, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listening to one of your episodes, I, I hadn't really thought about, it's been a long time since I read Elaine Aaron's book and I forgot about sound being a potential trigger. And, and yeah. it just brought me back again because it's so funny because my husband likes to listen to the TV loud, like he'll talk really loud on the phone. And for me, that's so abrasive. And I, I don't know, you know, it's just part of my nature. So I'm constantly yeah. asking him to turn down the radio or turn down the TV. And, and for a long time, I was like, maybe I need to just get over this. And of course, there will mm -hmm. always be situations where I can't ask or or people can have the right to say no too but I right. you know I feel so much more permission to understand that it's okay that that grates me and that that yeah. you know that's just part of my I don't know my my system and and what you know feels overstimulating or not yeah strong smells bright lights loud loud noises we can be sensitive to textures I, you know I don't talk about this as much because this is a small part and I think people think that this is a big part of what it is but yeah we are going to be more attuned. Like I used to keep earplugs on me because things just would be too loud. And it's not really polite to walk around with your, you know, with your fingers. In your <laughs> too loud. <laughs> uh, so uh, I've, we talked about this a little bit before we went live, but many people in this community are returning to their arts passion after years mm -hmm. or decades of being told that their art is not important or, um, they've been told it's not valuable for them to spend time on this as an activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that there are a lot of people who are very vulnerable around the risk taking and inevitable failures that actually come with being an artist, whether or not it's a failure in terms of, uh, you know, growing your skill and working towards new levels of skill or applying to exhibit your art or sell it and ask for that sale. Um, can you can you speak to this a little bit in terms of an HSP perspective? Sure. I, I think we want to get things right. We want to get things perfect, which can often hold us back. One of my favorite mottos is done is better than perfect. And it can really be a challenge because we want to wait until it's perfect. And what I know is I've grown so much since I started this podcast because it's just brought into consciousness how how, how many of the things that I struggle with. And what I'm learning is like, we need to feel the fear, feel the vulnerability and do it anyways. Not so much that it undoes us. But when I did like my first podcast interview on somebody else's podcast, I felt like I was going to throw up. Like that's a vulnerability hangover. Mm -hmm. And we may get vulnerability hangovers initially and finding ways to know that it's okay to have those feelings. And if we wait until we have the courage or the confidence, it's not going to happen. And so we really need to find ways to increase our distress tolerance and know that like, I'm, I'm going to feel afraid. Like I just went to this conference. I wanted to go the night before I go through, I know I go through this thing. Like, I don't want to go this. Is, like I literally was counting up like, how much am I going to lose an airfare and in a hotel if I don't go? I, I know myself, like I just get nervous and I went and had an amazing time. And again, my capacity for being around 3000 people in a very people-y environment, you know, I, I figured what I needed to do. So it's not about waiting until like, we feel like we're ready. It's about feeling the fear, feeling the whatever it is and doing it anyways. And that's how we build up this muscle. What happens is the volume goes down. We, we may or may not ever have this like, I've arrived. And when we do, then we usually get the gremlins coming and are like, who the hell do you think you are? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. And you just know that that's part of the process. So you have people that you can talk like, oh, I'm feeling like a fraud again. Right. 
Yeah, I really want to emphasize what Patricia just said there too to all of you watching. You know, she just said you you got to own that it's there and and go for it anyways and that is part of the process. That is part of the journey. There's yeah. nothing that means that there's something wrong with us or that we're doing the journey wrong in some way because we're having these experiences. It's a natural part of growing, learning and putting ourselves out there uh, especially with something that we care about. Yeah. And and people here really care about art. Yeah. And and that's that can feel very vulnerable in general for everyone because it feels like an extension of our person putting it yeah. out there for people to see. And social media makes it so easy today for people to uh, offer unasked for uh, criticism or or just tell you they don't like your work. And that can be really scary. And we get to decide how and when we present that work and, and how and when we deal with responses that might ultimately show up that we don't like. Right. I just was working with a client who is a an artist and she, her mentor had said like, you know, if you don't work on your, pro, you know, on your creativity four hours a day, like you are never going to be anything. And she has fibromyalgia. She has a lot of, HSPs tend to have a lot of autoimmune disorders. And she felt like if I stop, it's really hard for me to get back into it. And we really had to look at like, that's a very fear-based model. I mean, I, Carrie, I don't know what your perspective is. So if I'm rubbing you and your community the wrong way, like, mm, sorry, nope. it's a very fear based idea. Like if I'm saying I want to write a book and I'm not doing anything, well, I probably need to come up with a plan. And so having a time to write every day is a way to get somebody that wants to do something and doesn't know how to start. But as highly sensitive people, we've got to honor our rhythms. And I've got day like my son is going through something. He's 19. And like my my little mama heart hurts. And I've had to slow down the last couple of days. I, I just know that I don't have the bandwidth to deal with other people's stress and drama. And my little mama heart hurts. And so I need to slow down. And so we need to take that trust into our process that if we're tired and we need to rest, that fear of like, oh, I'm not producing. When we rest and take care of ourselves, that allows the creativity to come back in. And how many times have you been doing dishes or doing yoga or you're on a walk and like you get this great inspiration for something because you're not sitting efforting trying to be creative. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. forcing things and, and feeling like, uh, again, you failed or something's wrong if you don't adhere to an initial goal we set for ourselves, I think can yeah. be very limiting and, and also kind of limit our joy and experience of the journey and creative process because then yeah. we're not allowing ourselves to be flexible and and adjust to the discoveries that come with making and and that's not just in an artwork but just being a creative person yeah I, I think for many of us some things come very easily and so we kind of expect things to come easily and when they don't I mean this is true for me like I try and it's like well that didn't work screw that and I can really see how I'm working on building that muscle because we have very high expectations. We get disappointed very easily. People tell us, lower your expectations. It just doesn't happen. I mean, with things that I know that that I'm that I have a high expectation, I can lower the bar. But the truth is most of the time I'm like, oh, oh, I had an expectation. I didn't realize it. Like, okay, and shake it off. You know, so knowing how we're wired, I think really can help too. So we have these strong responses and we get thrown by them. It's like, okay, just got to, you know, pivot and try again, pivot and try again, pivot and try again. And, and we don't hear enough of that. Mm -hmm. Something I've been trying to use in terms of language in the community is saying, let's treat all of these things like experiments yeah. rather than this this goal, like that's, uh, I don't know, just such a like boxed in idea where we feel like yeah. there's only one version or one result that's valuable. And I, personally, I found this practice of thinking about my art, the putting myself out there for both the art education community I have here and my own artist practice, when I see, okay, well, let's test this idea. Let's experiment yeah. with this idea. I don't feel as much, um, I don't know, fear around the risk taking. And I don't feel as much judgment when it doesn't turn out how I expect. Yeah, it's about the process and not the outcome. But we're so outcome driven, you know, mm -hmm. that I have to produce something that is ABC as opposed to, I'm just going to enjoy, you know, the process of whatever it is, and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, then I'll, you know, try GEF or, you know, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What's something you wish more people understood about highly sensitive people or um, about being highly sensitive? It's an amazing strength. It really is a gift. And there are so many ways that when we are an informed HSP and we, if we've got wounding, I mean, I think we all have wounding. I, I have 
I have a lot. I've been in therapy for a lot of years. My therapist didn't know about the trait of being highly sensitive. So I really think the first thing is, is to become an educated and informed HSP. If you've got wounding, find you know someone you can work with that is familiar with the trait of high sensitivity. Because once you know that, then you see the strengths. And then when somebody goes like, oh, you're so sensitive, you go like, yeah, what does that bring up for you? <laughs> Looks like that makes you feel really uncomfortable because it's it's really not about us. It's really about other people. And when we feel confident in who we are, we're like, yeah, what does that bring up for you? I have times where I feel more vulnerable. I have times when I'm not able to be assertive. I have times when I'm making up stories in my head. I, I don't live a perfectly charmed life. And you know, I've learned to sit with the discomfort. And if I can't say something for a couple of days and then I can, then I do. So it's really about, having so much self-acceptance and knowing like, yeah, I'm kind of in that hole again. And, you know, the hole isn't as deep and as bad and I don't stay in it as long. And it's okay when I go there. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any recommended practices or strategies that you see people um, that you coach using regularly that has seems to help them kind of regulate or, or be a little more self-compassionate? I mean, breath work is always really important. Breath work is so important. Mindfulness above anything else, like radical self-compassion. And if if we're feeling resistant, to own the resistance. You know, I don't want to create. I don't want to clean the house. I don't want to exercise. Like, I'm just resistant and I don't want to do it. Like, it's okay to name that. There's so much power in just naming what's going on. I have, I have that thing with paperwork and I had paperwork sitting on the table for a couple of weeks and I finally just called the person and said, like, I am so sorry, how I'm showing up for you is like, not how I show up in the rest of my life. And it must feel awful for you to have to chase me down because I and, and every time they call back to give me information, I won't pick up because I get overwhelmed. <laughs> 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 you know, but it's like naming it like, okay, now right. I can stay on top of it. But we have these little things that are subtle that we just kind of like shove under the rug. And we're, they kind of rub against our integrity or how we want to show up. And then it kind of chinks away at us. Mm -hmm. And so just really being able to name what's going on, to have radical self-acceptance about it, to be informed about our traits, you know, so that we can really start to embrace it. And if you need to work with somebody or do some reading, like whatever you need to do so that you know who you are and how you're wired and you feel good about it. And you may get pushback from other people and that's okay. It's their stuff. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so I, um, you already gave me the links and I'll make sure links to everything we're talking about today are below this video for all of you. But um, I'm curious, do you, you mentioned a couple episodes you had on creativity um, on your podcast, which can you talk to them briefly, talk about them briefly? Right. Here? I think episode eight with Rachel Moore, she talked about creativity. She's a local therapist in town here. And then I understand you had Grace Chan on. Yes. And so she was on, uh, you'll link to the episode. I, it might be. 26? I think I it was 26. I just saw my email. Okay. So that's okay. <laughs> it's 26. <laughs> so those were really good episodes. If um, your listeners, can I pitch something? Yeah. I have an online HSP course. I have a scholarship slot available. And so if you listen to the most recent episode, bonus episode 54, it'll tell you, uh, I think episode 37 talks about the course, but if you're interested in a scholarship, I've got Somebody gifted a scholarship that on Sunday I'll do a drawing. So you want to jump on it if it's interesting to you. That sounds great. Thank you so yeah. much for offering that. Yeah. Um, so I have one more question, but before I do that, I just want to thank you, Patricia, for your time, for your wisdom, for your wonderful passion and enthusiasm for talking about this, this very important topic for oh, especially our creative community here. I kind of come alive when I talk. <laughs> I'm like, oh, let me talk about each of Yeah. That's how I feel about art and art education. Yeah. I talk, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's so lovely when people are doing the work they are called to do. And it's very evident that that's what you're doing. Oh, so, thank you. Um, so our last question is, what does it mean to you to be creative? You know, I think creativity takes so many more forms other than what we traditionally think about. And so it can be gardening or like spending time with my dog is creative. Mm -hmm. It can be cooking. I mean, I, I just think that, and I think for... I don't think what I know for HSPs is we tend to be great at problem solving. We tend to like, I asked my guests about play and a lot of people go like, huh. I think our definition of play is a very extroverted social model. Mm -hmm. And so many people say like, I love solving puzzles or I love solving problems or I love sitting down and writing or I love reading that often we tend to be more intellectual and like love to use our brains. And so, and we don't count that, like that doesn't count, you know, that, that doesn't, it's, there's no tangible thing. 
So I think that creativity takes all kinds of forms and whatever really brings us joy is creative. Like my office sits, I have a bank of windows and I came back from this retreat and I realized how much I miss nature. I don't live in nature. So I put up a hummingbird feeder. I got a flat uh, bird feeder because we have squirrels. It took for, I can get asking like, what's squirrel crack? You know, like, I kept, like <laughs> what can I get that's like crack for squirrels? I have a squirrel now that comes, the squirrel is probably three feet from where I sit and it will sit in this feeder. It'll pop up. And I watch this, I take videos, like I, I'm glad it didn't come up because like, I'd be like, oh, look at the squirrel. <laughs> I get so much joy out of watching this little squirrel in there. So yeah. whatever brings us joy, just go with it. It can be baths. I mean, it can be anything. I totally agree. That's a wonderful yeah. way to end this episode. So thank you everyone watching for joining us for another episode of um, how to be an artist creator profile. Um, again, one more time, I'll make sure all the links that Patricia mentioned, um, as well as her website are linked below this video so that you have access to it. And I'd love for you guys to keep the conversation going. Is there a big aha moment that you've had? Are you HSP and didn't realize it? Uh, tell us more in the comments below and let's keep that conversation going. Thanks again, guys for being here. And thank you, Patricia. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.